a man um, walks into his doctor's office one morning and says to the doctor, I have this continual terrible headache. Um, can you do something for me? And the doctor said, hopefully, he said, let me ask you a few questions first. Do you drink a lot of liquor? I mean, that's an obvious question. Um, Certainly not, he said. I never touched the filthy stuff. Well, do you smoke? No, that's a disgusting habit. I wouldn't dare do a thing like that. Well, I'm a bit embarrassed about asking you the next question, but you know what some men are like. Do you um, go out at night and mix with the wrong kind of women? <clears throat> said, Doctor, who do you think I am? I wouldn't dream of doing such a thing. In fact, he says, I spend an hour in church every evening, and I'm in bed every night by 10 o'clock. Right, says the doctor. Um, tell me, he says, the pain in your head, is it, is it a kind of sharp and, and shooting headache? Something like, yes, that's exactly what it's like. Oh, well, sim that's simple, said the doctor. You have your halo on too tight. <laughs> You have your halo on too tight. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> what did he say? You have your halo on too tight. All we need to do is loosen it a little bit. Mm. Well, when you try to live up to your ideals, that makes life very difficult. Now, I just this, this morning, as I sat up there, I don't know if I shared this with you before, but uh, when Monsignor Clem and myself were in the seminary, it was um, customary, customary. Every Sunday, we went down to a high mass in the cathedral, in the Cathedral of the Assumption. That's in a place called Thurles in County Tipperary. That's where we were ordained uh, 49 years ago. He looks it, I don't. <coughs> no, sorry. <laughs> So, <clears throat> no, these are offside marks. And um, seriously, when the priest would get up on the pulpit in those days to give a sermon, I would break out in a cold sweat. Now, this is very true. And I would think, I can never, ever do that. I want to be a priest, but I'm never, ever, ever going to be able to stand up or give a homily or a sermon. And so I thought, maybe I'm in the wrong place. I n now, how wonderful and amazing God is. Because if you say, said to me, at the moment, without <clears throat> an idea in your head, how do you feel? And I'd say, you know something, I feel very relaxed. Um, very relaxed. And so I often, I thank God from the bottom of my heart f for that, because for me, it's a miracle to be able to stand here before you and, be, and feel relaxed. And I think one of the things that helps me to be so relaxed is that I'm not afraid of getting it wrong. <laughs> now, I can honestly say that. I've no worries about getting it wrong. And I'm not embarrassed about making a mistake. And that's, that's, that's how I am. Now, so having said that, I want you to try, because I'm, I'm doing this for myself as much as for you. I want you to try and think along with me this morning. And if at any time you don't 
uh, fall of what I'm trying to say. Put up your hand. You can ask a question seriously because we do that back in our own place. Don't, don't hesitate. We had a beautiful mass here for the children on uh, Friday morning, and I said to the children, is there anybody who would like to ask me a question? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they were magnificent, and the questions that I was asked, it was beautiful, but some very searching questions. Now, having said that, in the gospel this morning, Jesus says, the one who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, have you ever tried to think that through? Have you ever tried to think that through? The way I see it, and the way I'm working on my own life at the moment and in my own spirituality is along these lines. For a good part of my life, and I'm sure this applies to most of us, I built up an image of myself, a kind of a, a persona. <clears throat> I was here, and there was another person there that was an image I had of myself. Does that make sense to you? A persona, or it wasn't, it wasn't the real me. I was trying to live up to what I thought I ought to be like. Now, <clears throat> hopefully you can go along with that. And that's, I think, how many, many people try to live their, their lives. And then I began thinking, <clears throat> I went right back to the beginning of time, really, back to the book of Genesis, and tried to think through the meaning of God made me in his image and likeness. <clears throat> so whether I like it or not, I am God-like. And you, and you, and every one of you are God-like. Isn't that, isn't that an awesome thought? Hmm? You're made in the image and likeness of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesus then came and even told us more about that. And he was totally inclusive. That's why in Jesus' preaching, two-thirds of the gospel of his teaching were about forgiveness and inclusivity. There is nobody outside. Everybody is included. Now, we very often exclude people because they're not in our group. We do it in the church all the time. We categorize people. We put labels on people. I try nowadays never, never, never to do that. So remember that two-thirds of the teaching of Jesus was about forgiveness and in inclusivity. Everybody, everybody was welcome to Jesus. Then signs came in. And in case we were in any doubt, I don't know if you realize that science and religion today are becoming closer and closer. And so science came along uh, not all that long ago, in the year uh, 1953. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And they proved, yes, we are made in the image of God because, because, have you ever thought this through? God is unique. There is nobody like God. God, and I am, and you are, every one of you are unique, because each one of us has got a unique DNA. Am I right or wrong? Have you ever applied religion to that, what, what it means? That God has made you unique, 
a unique person. You're special. And then what happens when you go uh, through an airport nowadays, something, they take your fingerprint. So isn't it absolutely fascinating that every person in this church, every person in the whole world has a unique fingerprint? Hmm? So there's nobody like, have you ever thought of that? Isn't that fantastic? There's nobody like you. Therefore, what right would I have in any way to be judgmental or to put anybody down or to, to look down on anybody and say, well, they are not quite as good as, good as me. They are not in my group. We, we apply so many false notions, false ideas, I meant to say, concepts to people. He's better because he's more successful. Well, well, success is not what it's all about. Who was the greatest person that ever lived? Jesus, Jesus. He was the greatest person that ever lived. And, and if you look up at the cross, look at the cross. He died naked as a criminal between two thieves. Could you be a bigger failure? Hmm? Have you ever thought that? Hmm? Isn't it? Isn't it awesome when you think about it? So, when you become real, that's the meaning of humility. It's not standing in the corner with your head down and beating your breast and saying, I'm the worst of all people in the world. I'm useless. And there are so many poor people like that. I'm a sinner. I meet them all the time. But when you face the reality, the reality being real, I'm weak, I'm human, I have a built-in flaw, call it original sin. I'm weak, I'm prone to fall at times, but that never comes between me and the Lord. That's absolutely beautiful. That's one, of the, that's one of the reasons, I think, why children are so beautiful. I, as a priest, and I find it all so sad today, I absolutely love children. And strange to say, I've, I've shared this with people before, I never found celibacy overly difficult until I got to my age. Now, let me clear up that quick. <laughs> but today, I suddenly realize what I have missed by being a celibate, because I see the joy in grandparents' eyes when they have a little grandchild, and how I would love to have a grandchild. And you do, you know, as, as you get all done. That's the sacrifice I made for God. So you who are parents and grandparents, God bless you, you're so lucky. But I absolutely love little children, and I just abhor, I just cannot even abhor anybody who would anyway abuse a little child. So, so sad, and I can never you know, keep seeking forgiveness for that in our church. And, but I know the Lord ultimately forgives. But children are beautiful. And why are they so beautiful? Because they're totally free of what? All the inhibitions you and I put on ourselves. Totally, totally free. It reminds me of a lovely little story. And it fits in with the gospel this morning about inviting people for dinner. Um, this little family decided to invite their local pastor around for d dinner. And as dad was going out to work uh, one morning, mum says to uh, dad, or oh, she says, don't forget 
We've got Father Murphy coming tonight for dinner. Make sure you have plenty of wine and whiskey in, because you know, he drinks like a fish. <laughs> oh, don't worry, I'll have plenty in. So he goes off to work, and he comes home from work, and his wife has a lovely dinner cooked, and uh, they sit down at table with little Johnny, who's five years old. And um, there, they, they have, uh, they, they begin dinner. Um, Johnny, they ask Johnny to say grace before meals, and he says a lovely little prayer before meals. And then um, Dad says to Father Murphy, would you like some more wine? Would you like some wine, Father? Oh, sure, sure, he says, sure. Another drop won't do me any harm. But every time he put the glass to his lips, little Johnny went like that. And eventually, Mom says to little Johnny, Johnny, why are you staring at Father every time he puts the glass to his lips? And little Johnny says, I'm waiting for him to do his trick. <laughs> what trick, she said. Well, I heard you saying to Daddy this morning, Father Murphy drinks like a fish. <laughs> and so, so that's why children are so beautiful. Out of, you know, out of the mouths of children. And, and that's why I just love celebrating Mass with, with children. You never know what you're going to get of, of what to ex expect. So to finally bring this to a nice con conclusion, will you try and realize um, I think it was St. Thomas Kempis in The Imitation of Christ said, the greatest knowledge we can have is the knowledge of self. That's the greatest knowledge in the whole world. And when you accept yourself, none of us are perfect. And you may be sitting there, and you may be feeling at the moment, well, I'm bad, and I have a terrible weakness that I've been trying to overcome for years and years, and I can't succeed. Look, look, that could be your stepping stone to heaven. That weakness. Make friends with your weakness. Don't empower it by fighting against it. Jesus never condemned a sinner. He only condemned those who were not prepared to admit their sins. He had no time for people who are, who are never wrong, but always right. I'm sure you know people like that. Maybe some of you are married, married to one. <laughs> Today, thank God, I have no hesitation None at all in saying, I got that wrong. What's wrong with that? I was wrong. I made a mistake. It's so freeing. And you, it really, it really is. And nobody understands that better than the Lord. Honestly, honestly, honestly. So let's stand and pray.